Man, Shovel Knight was great, wasn't it? It's this awesome retro throwback with a fantastic score, but my favourite bit about the game was how it all feeds into Shovel Knight's very simple toolset. The swipe, the jump, and the bounce. Every single level and every single boss is designed to explore these mechanics in a bunch of different ways. The bouncy green slime beetles and the weird slime lava in Mole Knight stage are all about testing your mastery of the bounce, and these fast horizontally attacking wolves and the magic rainbow platform fountain from Polar Knight's lair get you to think about Nighty McShovelface's swipe attack in a whole new way. You probably already know all this, and I did too, but that's what made it all the more surprising when I found out about a brand new way to play the game. And I'm betting you've not heard of it either, since 98.7% of people who own Shovel Knight also haven't. And I get that figure, well, I'll, uh, I'll tell you later. Until recently, I was content to file Shovel Knight alongside other games I'd played, enjoyed, but had no real intention of going back to. That is, until a friend told me about a no items playthrough. The goal is to go through the entire game without buying any of the relics, without upgrading your magic, not buying meal tickets, or any other upgrades. You'd think going through Shovel Knight's whole adventure with only his default moves would be really boring, but it totally breathed new life into the game and gave me a whole new appreciation for Shovel Knight's mechanical foundation. Changing how I engage with the game actually heightened my focus onto what made it great in the first place. In Shovel Knight, stuff like the Propeller Dagger lets you skip a quite frankly disgusting amount of the game, and the Chaos Orb rinses nearly every boss. But without those items to use as a crutch and a diminished health pool, it turns particularly the bosses into a real challenge I previously had no appreciation for. Small details like how Polar Knight blocks your bounce attacks and counters, forcing you to engage him on the ground and risk spiky death, or the way King Knight's stage is all about perfecting your timing. From these charging horses to the introduction of these blocking knights, this griffin boss and the man himself, they all encourage waiting for the perfect moment to strike and capitalising on openings something I ignored during my first playthrough as I just kind of fireballed them all to death. My time with Shovel Knight got me thinking. People have been doing what I've lazily called challenge runs for decades. This has taken the form of no take backs Iron Man playthroughs, attempts to make an underpowered or niche strategy work, or even speedruns. These are all ways of running through a game in a manner that challenges you in a very deliberate, specific way. But what's the secret ingredient for a truly great one? A different way of playing that tests your established knowledge and mastery while still giving you a brand new experience. There's also the question of why Yacht Club hid what may as well be an additional gameplay mode in the first place, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a look at how most developers try to keep a game fresh and exciting. Simply put, it's to add more. More mechanics, more characters, more numbers, more… more of whatever that is. We see it all the time in games. When we introduce new aspects to a title, they aren't just fun to play around with on their own, but they also allow us to recontextualize and get a brand new perspective on existing mechanics. The introduction of the sneaky Clan of the Snake and the skirmish unit to Viking Starvation Simulator Northgard in an update forces a rethink about how players plan their defense. Both the new clan and the new units have ways of bypassing natural defenses like monster infested territory and excel at hit and run tactics, adding a really satisfying degree of depth to guarding your territory as you'll have to defend against sudden attacks that can't be easily stopped by building a few guard towers. The logic here just kind of makes sense. The more things there are in a game, the more ways there are to engage with the core experience. Right? Well, not entirely. This approach can run into problems, because the more new challenges and things to do you add onto a game, the less precise things become. Take the follow up to hit Diablo E Shooter Borderlands 2, the pre sequel, which is a terrible name. It's more of the same game really, but with a silly oxygen system and floaty gravity that's just kind of tacked on in a way that doesn't play nice with the rest of the game, like when these collectibles go flying all over the place and then start to clip into terrain. Not too fun. Adding too many secondary mechanics can really compromise the experience of playing a game because your perspective on the bits that matter has become blurred. Pokemon is a fantastic example of the dangers of this philosophy. At its core, the game is all about the battling and capturing of Pokemon, but because of how generous the game is and all the helpful side mechanics, you never really have to think about your choices. Nearly every fight can be brute forced if you try enough times and it's very easy to assemble a team of killer rare Pokemon if you're willing to look for them and plan in advance, robbing the battle system of a lot of the depth it could otherwise have. So if adding too much to an already bloated game makes it harder to experience the bits that matter, maybe the opposite is what's needed to give us a clearer picture of Pokemon's core experience. Battling and falling in love with cute, highly marketable creatures, born to fight and die for your amusement. Enter the Nuzlocke Challenge, 
a different way to play that greatly restricts your usage of the catching mechanic and items, whilst leaving the core battling gameplay unchanged. The rules are simple, you can only catch the first Pokemon you see per area, no exceptions, and if a Pokemon faints, then it, uh, gets shipped off to a lovely farm in the country to recover. Yeah. These simple subtractions from the existing formula massively change the game, because now you can't rely on a tailor-made team to auto-win every battle, and mistakes are punished harshly. The end result is a scrappy all-or-nothing campaign which sees you engaging in tense battles with real stakes, using Pokemon you never ordinarily would have considered to fill gaps on your team. For example, this fella, Grubbin and its evolutions, which are objectively speaking terrible Pokemon that I initially hated the design of, but now, thanks to a love forged in blood and hardship, I've really warmed up the little guy. The Nuzlocke run proves that brand new and sometimes even superior experiences can be born by simply restricting how we engage with some choice elements of the original game, and letting the core experience manifest itself differently, to the point that I can't even go back to playing Pokemon normally anymore. To me, this is the core idea behind any great challenge run. Restrict how we engage with the game to see the core experience in a different way. Iron Man playthroughs remove the luxury of reloading a save, the Nuzlocke run nerfs items in the Pokemon centers, and Shovel Knight's no items run forces you to master the fundamentals. But that's not all there is to it, is there? I can restrict myself to only melee attacks in an FPS, and it just kind of breaks things. So how should we be restricting players in order to produce the best experiences? Well, a good game to look at there would be Diablo 3, something I never really got into. That is, until I decided, screw the granny for shiny loot, I'm going to play every character in hardcore mode, meaning that just like in the Nuzlocke run, death is permanent. Suddenly, dying was more than a setback, it was a permanent end to my character, and before I knew it I was meticulously comparing bits of gear to maximise my survival odds, really thinking about my ability loadout, and engaging in some butt clenchingly close calls that would have been just kind of annoying had I been playing in the game normally, and the weird thing is, I still kind of was. My demon hunter was hunting demons in exactly the same obnoxiously edgy way she always does, so what was the difference? A good challenge run rarely if ever changes the actual mechanics of a game, because the experience is an internal one. That's why it's important to restrict mechanics in a way that changes the way we think and feel about games, not remove the ones we actually need to use to play them. In Dishonored, a pacifist playthrough is a pretty massive restriction on how you can play, but the meat of the experience, the sneaking around and level traversal mechanics, go virtually unchanged. We get a different perspective, less power fantasy and more tense skullduggery, but one that still utilises the great mechanics that drew us to the game in the first place. A fun example is the Gnome Challenge in Half-Life 2 Episode 2, in which you've got to take this little guy all the way through the entire game, making sure not to leave him behind. Simply restricting your play by shackling this gnome-shaped ball and chain to you forces you to play more cautiously and really messes with the vehicle bits in a cool way. Speedrunning is a hugely widespread challenge run format. The games and how you play them are kept almost entirely the same, but the time pressure and the competitive angle given to normally single player games forces you to make tough choices, work out the optimal routes, and figure out unconventional solutions to problems you ordinarily wouldn't have considered. The normal idea is that you are supposed to kill the enemies and get a ton of gold and then catch Shield Knight. Uh, instead, it's faster to die. However, in this first one, we're actually going to try and collect a little bit of gold, um, and then die as fast as possible. A fantastic expansion of these ideas can be found in Dark Souls. For the longest time, I was one of those guys. The cow behind a big shield and inch forwards very cautiously, investing all my points into endurance and stamina guys. Yeah, I was a piece of shit, but I still really enjoyed Dark Souls. It wasn't until a few years later that I went back to the game and just so happened to not use a shield that I found I was experiencing things in a very different way. Certain bosses melted under my new aggressive technique, but against bad guys like the Pursuer, I had to learn a whole new approach to playing the game, giving me that wonderful feeling of mastering the unknown, even though I'd already beaten this boss before. Dark Souls is specifically designed to facilitate not just a single challenge run, but a near infinite variety of them. How? Because the core experience of white knuckle fights against baddies is always there, even if you're barely using any of the actual mechanics. People have beaten Dark Souls without dodging, blocking, levelling up, using a weapon, or even getting hit, but the game is still always possible to beat. It's really hard, but it's doable. This means that in any given playthrough, players can choose what parts of the game they want to engage with and in what flavours, confident in the knowledge that the challenges facing them are always very much surmountable. By making nearly every bit of equipment and playstyle a viable, if not optimal choice, you ensure the underlying experience is always accessible, 
you're just choosing the methods with which you engage with it. The challenge run is player agency distilled. It's the ultimate expression of a back and forth between an artist and their audience. It's both an homage to the person who made the game, and a way of adding a personal flair to something in order to make it your own. Almost like remixing a song. The melody and chords usually aren't changed, but the instruments and tempo are. Which brings us back to Shovel Knight and that final question. Why don't developers advertise the challenge runs they've so obviously accommodated for in their games better? Why hide them? Well, that's because rather than being flashy new things the developer is trying to show you, challenge runs are limits you have to impose on yourself. It's impossible to list all the different ways you can play a game, and even if you could, chances are players would pick one that's not right for them. We've seen this in the miserable time some people have with Metro 2033's Ultra Hard Ranger Mode. Advertised by well-meaning fans as the real way to play the game, but it only seems that way with the benefit of your prior experience. A new player is just going to be frustrated and confused by their scarce ammo and near total lack of a UI, even though the heightened realism will force seasoned players to reconsider old strategies. Both designers and players need to let others make the choice to challenge themselves, rather than twisting it into some sort of obligation. Whilst a good game is probably going to be good for a lot of people, the ideal way to experience it is something that will vary from person to person, which is what Yacht Club understands perfectly. In my case, I was looking for a way to really get my teeth into one of the best platforms of the last few years I felt like I'd not quite… gotten. That's why a playthrough with no items was what I needed, because it focused in on the nuts and bolts of Shovel Knight's awesome retro throwbackiness, and why I was really surprised to see this upon being the game. An achievement. It turns out, the developers wanted me to play this way after all, they just couldn't directly tell me about it because like Dishonored's pacifist campaign, the Nuzlocke challenge and what I now know is called a penny pincher playthrough, I needed to discover it for myself in order to really appreciate the new perspective it granted me and I'm really glad they gave me that chance. Have you got a cool challenge run you've found out about or invented? Well why don't you tell me about it in the comments? Or contact me directly on the Architect of Games hotline. That's 0118999-881999-119-7253. Terms and conditions may apply. Calls cost $10 a second plus your standard network rate and may result in mild seizures and feelings of existential dread. Typing or even thinking about this phone number condemns your soul to the endless void of the dark god Galzork. Your call may be monitored for training purposes. Hi and thanks for watching. This show is made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Supporters on Patreon get a bunch of cool things like monthly updates, early access to videos, and behind the scenes looks at things I wanted to talk about that didn't make it into the video. In addition to those cool things, $10 patrons get a special shout out and they are Samuel Vanderplatz, Alex Deloch, Jonathan Kirkinson, Strateger in Ultima, Joseph Robson, Patrick Romberg, Brian Notariani, Joshua Binswanger, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Asaran, Baxter Heel, Ray's Dad, Daniel Metjes, James Lamont, and Chow. Thank you all for watching and supporting the channel, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!